Okay, so um, as I said, my name is Lisa Marshall. I'm the co-director of Heat Smart Tompkins. That's a new role for me. I just uh, started in that job um, a couple of months ago. And with me also is Jonathan Comstock, Comstock, who was the program director for several years and is also the founder of, of Heat Smart Tompkins. We are a community nonprofit. Our mission is to just do education and outreach around energy efficiency for um, homes and also for commercial properties um, about energy efficient home heating solutions such as insulating air sealing and installing heat pump systems. We um, want everybody to know about the cost savings, the comfort and health benefits, and the climate solutions that um, are available to you for your home. We don't make any money off of anything you may or may not buy as a result of our presentations. So our goal is to be your guide. We are a resource for you. Um, studies have shown that the reason that more people don't have heat pumps in their home in the US is that they don't know about them. Both, that's both people don't, consumers don't know about them and also um, HVAC installers don't really know um, about them or enough about them and all the benefits of them. So, um, so we've, he, we founded Heat Smart to fill that knowledge gap um, so that heat pumps will become widespread and fossil fuel heating will um, join the ash heap of history, we hope, soon. Um, so we do, we fulfill that role by making sure that there's accessible information to you about all of the options for your home and we help you to figure out which options might be best for you. Um, that includes providing transparency around the costs and the quality. Not all heat pumps are the same. Um, and we're a neutral source to answer your questions or troubleshoot as you go through the process. That process could start with just learning about what the options are, to thinking about what choices you want to make in your home, to choosing which proposal from a contractor you might want to go with by helping you um, understand what, what has been proposed to you, and helping you through the process um, if you're getting something installed. Um, and you have any questions or problems along the way, that's what Jonathan and I are here for, is to help you. So HeatSmart Tompkins was the first HeatSmart program, and we're really proud of that. Um, it, we started here as Solar Tompkins with a Solarize campaign, and that was so successful that the founders of Solar Tompkins turned their idea to what other uh, community resource on climate solutions could we provide and we lit upon heat smart at first we were funded by uh, community foundations and um, but quickly new york state's uh, new york state nicerta which is a, a new york state agency funded by all of us on our utility bills um, decided that the heat smart program was so important that they were going to fund it and they were going to start heat smart programs around new york state so this map shows um, some of the other programs and some of you might on this webinar might be from some of our neighbor programs, the Southern Tier program, the Otsego program, or the Heat Smart Central New York program. And you are very welcome on this webinar as well. <laughs> okay, so Heat Smart in the time of COVID is we've had to change our practices. What we really love to do is go out in the community and meet you face to face, introduce you to um, our installers face to face. And um, we can't do that right now. So thus, we are hold, hosting these webinars. We also um, post the webinars on our website. So if you um, missed a webinar that you wanted to see, it will now be posted on the website. Or if you are telling your friends about the webinar and saying they should watch it, they can watch it on the website. We also um, now have some video home tours. We've gotten some happy HeatSmart customers to do video in their home and send it to us um, that we have posted on social media and on our website. And um, very importantly, we have protocols in place to keep you safe so that the heat, the heat smart process can go forward for you. Um, whether you're comfortable with somebody coming into your home or not, um, you can get a home assessment for, for free from any of our installers. Um, if you are comfortable with people coming to your home, our installers are taking precautions, taking their temperature, wearing gloves, hand sanitizing, washing their hands, wearing masks, and all of those good things. But if you're not comfortable, they can also give you a very good assessment remotely over the phone. You can send them pictures, they can ask questions, and um, 
they can assess your project that way as well. Okay, so that's me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to John Herod to talk, walk us through the do's and don'ts of cold climate air source heat pumps. Take it away, John. Yeah, thanks so much um, for everyone who's here today. Um, and uh, thank you also, uh, Lisa and Jonathan. Um, uh, initially, uh, HeatSmart had asked me to do a case study on one of our projects and I said, hey, you know, I just had, had written this article on this subject and I'd, I'd really like to present about this. So they um, uh, very kindly uh, uh, were flexible in, in allowing me to present this today. Um, for folks that, that know me and know Snug Planet, uh, they know that we're passionate about air source heat pumps. Um, we just think, you know, these have so much potential. Uh, they're flexible in their application. Uh, they're very efficient in both heating and cooling modes. Uh, they can be a very cost effective uh, um, choice, especially when you're replacing uh, an expensive fuel like oil or propane or electric resistance. And uh, all in all, they really uh, are the most uh, scalable path towards a, a low carbon housing stock. Um, so we really feel that the work that, that the Heat Smart programs are doing and uh, the stuff that we're out there doing every day is, is really on the right track to uh, getting fossil fuels out of people's homes. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that these systems can be really unforgiving when it comes to poor design and workmanship. And if you don't get these right, you'll end up with uh, poor temperature control, excessive noise, uh, inefficient operation, uh, a cycle of, of callbacks where you aren't able to resolve the underlying problem and ultimately a, a short lifespan and a low level of customer satisfaction. And, you know, one of the, the scary things about scaling something up is if you scale up something badly, you're going to end up with a lot of problems. So one of the things I'm really passionate about is is getting things right with air source heat pumps. And it's not that hard to do. Um, so uh, I've built on my own experiences, my own uh, reading on this subject. Uh, I ended up, uh, when I was sitting at home during the, the first stages of the pause, writing an article on this and submitting it to uh, the Building Performance Journal, which is a trade organization. Um, and for anyone who's interested, there'll be a link at the end um, where you can uh, email me and I can send you reprints. So the first big important thing starts back at the design stage and it's really important to size this equipment correctly. If we put in a system that's too small and here I'm not talking about physical size, I'm talking about heating and cooling capacity. If it's too small, it won't keep up under extreme weather and uh, you won't be able to maintain comfort and really hot, or really cold days. But Bigger isn't always better. If it's too big, you're going to lose efficiency. You're going to end up with a system that cycles on and off frequently. Uh, you may end up with temperatures that wander all over the place. So the question is, how do we find just right? And to do that, we follow a industry standard procedure. Uh, the Air Conditioning Contractors of America created a series of manuals. And the one that we use to determine how much heating or cooling a house needs uh, is their manual J. It's essentially a spreadsheet where you put in all the characteristics of the house, the window areas, uh, the window types, wall insulation levels, um, and so forth. And it will tell you, okay, this house needs so many BTUs to keep it warm on the coldest day that you're likely to experience. The better the information that you put into this calculation, the better results you'll get out of it. And that's one of the reasons that we like to, instead of just kind of guessing what a house's air leakage is, actually go and measure it and spend the time to accurately put in the um, window shading, for example, the, uh, the overhangs and the uh, um, uh, things like that that will affect how much sunlight comes into a house uh, on a hot day. Uh, so if we can do this calculation accurately, uh, we're going to end up with a system that is correctly sized to the house. Now, most of the heat pumps that we're going to be installing are modulating, which means that they can uh, 
vary their output across a certain range. And so what we want to do is size the system so that on the coldest day we're likely to experience the system is running pretty much flat out at maximum capacity. Uh, but the lower it can modulate down, the more efficient it's going to be on mild weather when we don't need that full capacity. So when we're picking out equipment, we want to first pick the right maximum output, but then within that look for ones that have a, a nice wide range of modulation. Um, another big lesson that we've learned is don't put ductless heads in small rooms if you can avoid it. Uh, this uh, picture comes from uh, one of the manufacturer's websites and you'll see it uh, replicated all across the internet. And here they've got a ductless head in every single room. Uh, this is not best practice. Um, essentially the smallest uh, these heads are made is about 6,000 BTUs. But oftentimes a small room like a laundry room or a home office might need a lot less than that. It might only need two or 3,000 BTUs. Um, so what can happen is that you have to install an outdoor unit that is pretty close to the sum of all the indoor units. If each of your indoor units is, is twice as big as it really needs to be for that room, you end up with an outdoor unit that's also twice as big and isn't able to modulate down far enough that when only one or two rooms is calling for heat, uh, it's able to run and run efficiently. And uh, so this can lead to all kinds of problems. One of the ways that manufacturers get around this is that if, say, this laundry room is only calling for 3,000 BTUs, but the outdoor unit can only modulate down to 8,000, those would be pretty typical numbers, uh, the outdoor unit has to bleed refrigerant through the other heads. And that can create unexpected hissing noises. It can wake people up in the night. It can also mean that you're putting heating or cooling into rooms where you don't want it. So um, we want to avoid this practice of, of putting heads in every room. Um, there are some ways that we can get around that. Uh, a couple solutions that we frequently use uh, one that we really like a lot are these compact ducted heads. So instead of a, a ductless head in each room, we might have a, um, a compact ducted system, which is uh, what you see here. It's essentially a, a little air handler that's hooked up to a very uh, compact duct system and provides heating or cooling to one part of the house. Uh, in this case, this was a, uh, a cute little three bedroom ranch, and we put a um, a high wall head like you saw in the previous picture in the great room, uh, which served the great room, dining room, kitchen area. And then for the bedroom wing, we put in this compact ducted air handler. It had three short duct runs that went to each of the bedrooms. And now instead of having a 6,000 BTU head in each bedroom, we've got a 9,000 BTU uh, air handler that splits its output between these three different rooms. So this is a really great solution. Uh, you have to have a place like a basement or a conditioned attic to put it. Another solution that we've used for very small rooms like bathrooms is to just put a, a small uh, length of electric baseboard or a radiant towel rack or some other uh, low output, uh, low consumption heater in those rooms. They really don't need cooling. Uh, they can get that passively from the basement. Um, really important, and everyone who's a heat smart installer, uh, I'm sure knows this by now, but it's, it's really important to elevate the outdoor unit above the average snow depth. And the reason that's usually given for this is that you don't want snow drifts to pile up over the unit. Uh, these need airflow to function properly. So we need to keep bushes and fencing away from the unit, but we also need to elevate it high enough that it's not gonna end up buried in snow. Um, but also really important is that we need to have free drainage under the unit. Uh, because these are extracting heat from the outdoor air, they're cooling the air that flows through them in the winter time, and so frost forms on the coils. And, uh, in cold weather, a couple times an hour, they will have to switch into defrost mode, 
uh, and that uh, frost that forms on the coils gets melted off and drips away. That's why you need the free drainage under the unit. If that ice starts to build up, it will eventually block airflow through the unit and in an extreme case could even crush the coils leading to loss of refrigerant and you know, kind of uh, catastrophic uh, damage to the system. So having that free drainage under the unit is really important. Um, this is something we did once and we will never do again. You don't want to mount the outdoor unit on a wood frame wall. Um, one of the ways that these systems get their efficiency is that they have variable speed compressors and fans. And so in order to match the heat load of the house as they're modulating, uh, they will ramp up that compressor and that uh, fan over a range of frequencies that might range from, for the compressor, from about 10 cycles per second up to about 120 cycles per second. Um, and somewhere in that range of, uh, frequencies is a frequency at which that siding is going to start to vibrate and you're going to get noise complaints. So we really, whenever possible, prefer to mount the unit on the ground like you see here, or if we need to attach it to a wall, we want to attach it to a, a masonry foundation wall. Um, this is a slide I thought was really interesting. This was done by uh, uh, Stephen Winter Associates that are uh, uh, real building science geeks and they did this very high-tech test where they uh, taped a piece of cardboard next to a, uh, uh, a high wall unit and used an infrared scanner to look at the temperatures. And what they found, not too surprisingly, is that the air that's coming into the unit, these units draw the air in at the top, they pass it over the heat exchanger and they blow it out at the bottom. The air that comes in at the top is not representative of the overall temperatures in the room. It's typically a few degrees higher. And this effect is uh, exaggerated when the unit is pressed right up against the ceiling. You don't get good airflow, you don't get good mixing. And so what happens is that you don't get good heat exchange because the air that you're bringing back into the unit is already warm. It doesn't have as much ability to absorb heat as if it were room temperature, you know, 66, 68 degrees. So the solution, um, if you're going to install a high wall unit, is to install it ideally uh, at least six inches down from the ceiling. And uh, that's what we have in this left picture here. Plenty of room for uh, mixing to occur. Um, because we're primarily a heating climate rather than a cooling climate, in some ways it's actually even more ideal to have our, our heat em emitters low in the room. And uh, these are a solution for that, these uh, what we call floor units. They're actually attached to the wall just a few inches above the, the floor, but uh, they're pulling in the coolest air close to the floor and uh, heating it, blowing it out. They work fine for cooling in our area. Um, the main reason I think we don't install more of these is that people tend to have um, more free wall space higher up in the room and most of the, uh, the space low in the room is, is uh, covered with, with furniture. So um, this is another really important thing that I, I think sometimes gets missed, which is properly sealing the places where the refrigerant piping and the control wires go through the house. Uh, heat pumps move heat in and out of the house using refrigerant that travels through copper pipes. And there's also control wires that carry signals back and forth between the indoor and outdoor unit. So there's typically at least one, sometimes more three inch holes drilled in the house. And if these aren't properly sealed, first of all, you'll get insects coming in. Uh, you'll get air leakage. Uh, if you're air conditioning, you can get hot, humid air that comes into the wall cavity. Uh, condensation happens and then you can get mold problems. And um, Another issue that you run into is that you don't get good temperature control. Uh, the hole that uh, allows the, uh, the piping and the wires to come into the unit is about here. 
the uh, sensor that senses the room temperature is about here on the unit. So if there's outdoor air leaking in and getting into the unit, it's gonna throw the temperature sensing all out of whack. So we really need to do a good job. Um, this isn't the, the prettiest photo on the left, but it just uh, shows the use of um, expanding foam used to thoroughly seal that hole where the piping goes in. On the right, we have a device called a wall sleeve, and uh, we strongly recommend that these uh, be installed every time we're um, uh, running piping through a wood frame wall that's full of something like fiberglass or cellulose, because you can't really get a good seal um, spraying this, uh, this spray foam into those uh, soft and fibrous materials. And so we in insert this little telescoping sleeve. It um, forms a nice, uh, tight, seal and, and something that holds the spray foam in and gives you a much better seal overall. And uh, they cost about 10 bucks a piece, but um, they, they are you know, a really uh, good thing to add to your, uh, to your work scope. Um, condensate, as we find that we're getting hotter and, and more humid summers, we're doing more air conditioning and managing condensate, which is the moisture that's pulled out of our indoor air and air conditioning becomes a really important consideration. Um, backing up to this uh, high wall unit, and I talked a lot about high wall units because they're about 90% of, of what we install. So the air comes in the top, passes over the heat exchanger, there's a little fan, and it blows out through the louvers. As it passes over the heat exchanger, it's cooled and condensation happens. That condensation runs down to a little drain pan and then that condensate drains by gravity out of the house and down to the ground. That's a pretty typical um, installation. It's 100% gravity drained. So in order for that to work properly, we have to pay a lot of attention to the pitch of this condensate pipe. Both where it leaves the house and all the way down to the ground. We have to make sure that it's sloping steadily, at least a quarter inch per foot all the way down. Um, they do get filled up with um, algae and spider webs over time. And so we also need them to be accessible so that we can uh, clean them out as part of our uh, annual maintenance. If you have a situation where you can't achieve a, a good slope with the condensate, you can use a condensate pump. This is a little cutaway diagram showing one type of uh, aftermarket condensate pump. So the condensate in this picture would be coming into this um, device that, that attaches onto the bottom of the unit. And in here is a little pump. It's, it's very similar to um, like a, a pump that you'd have in a fish tank or something like that. It also has a uh, switch so that if for any reason it fails, it stops the unit from operating and um, making a big mess uh, all over your, your um, interior of your house. Uh, this condensate pump can push this condensate up and into the attic and over to some uh, easier to, uh, to drain location. So this is another great solution. Uh, the one I have shown here attaches onto the bottom of the head itself. There are some that are small enough to actually fit within the, uh, the head itself. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I've been really uh, talking and, and uh, writing a lot about lately is refrigerant leaks. Um, refrigerants are what make heat pumps work. They absorb heat and they release it very efficiently depending on uh, the pressures that are creating in the system. So they can move heat into the house in the winter and out of the house in the summertime. Uh, the problem is that refrigerants, if they leak out, the system doesn't work. And if they get into the atmosphere, they themselves are very potent. Greenhouse gases, the ones that we use today, um, have uh, global warming potentials uh, several hundred to thousand times the same amount of carbon dioxide. So for a lot of reasons, we want to make sure that these refrigerant lines are 100% tight. And to do that, we really need to focus on uh, flaring technique. A flare is the way that we attach um, refrigerant lines in heat pump systems for the most part. There's a few other options, but uh, 
flaring is the dominant technique. So what we have here is a little cone of copper that we uh, forged with a, a tool. It presses onto a brass cone and then a flare nut slides over the whole assembly and tightens it down, forming a mechanical seal between the copper and the, uh, the brass cone. If that nut is not tightened enough, we get a leak. If it's tightened too much, it'll actually crush this flare and we'll get a leak. So we have to get that just right. And the only way to get the torque on these uh, flare nuts just right is to use a torque wrench. Um, there's different torque settings that are needed for different types of tubing. So the smaller tubing that we use, the quarter inch tubing, only needs about 13 foot pounds of torque. But the larger tubing, the 5 eighths tubing, needs um, 50 pounds of torque. So if you can imagine, you know, kind of the different level of force that you'd need to lift a 13 pound dumbbell versus a 55 pound dumbbell. Um, and then try to imagine doing that just based on feel, you'll, you'll understand quickly that it's not possible. Um, instead, we use these torque wrenches and uh, you set them to the desired torque and then you tighten the flare nut. And when you reach the desired torque, you hear a click and you stop. And this is the way to know that we're getting the, um, uh, the correct uh, tightness on these, these flare nuts. Um, and then, you know, for all the reasons I mentioned, we want to do everything we can to avoid refrigerant leaks. Uh, what we've kind of uh, reached consensus on is that there really needs to be four separate steps to your leak testing in order to uh, eliminate the vast majority of these leaks. And um, one of them is to fill the copper tubing that you've just installed with 500 PSI nitrogen and make sure that it holds that pressure. Um, some manufacturers will recommend a 24 hour test. Uh, we've concluded that the test can be much shorter as long as you go through and you apply this bubble solution, which is what I'm doing here, uh, to all the joints in the system. Check to make sure that no bubbles are forming, which would happen if that nitrogen was, was leaking out through the flares. Um, then we have to evacuate the system to get the air, the nitrogen, any residual moisture uh, out of the system. And that's, that's an important step in startup, um, but it gives you one more chance to check the tightness of the system. Uh, you evacuate the system down to a, a really deep vacuum, almost as deep as outer space, and then you make sure that it's able to hold that vacuum for a certain amount of time. And then once we actually put the refrigerant into the system, we go back and we do one more test. Uh, there are a few points in the system that you can't test with these other methods, like the actual uh, valves that you connect to the system. And so we'll go through at the end with an electronic uh, leak detector and uh, pass a little wand over these uh, spots and um, uh, just make sure that there's, there's no leaks at all. Um, Line set insulation. So the copper tubes are called line sets. And we've just expended a bunch of energy to extract heat from the cold outdoor air. We don't want to lose that heat back to the outdoor air by having lousy insulation like you see here on the left. We want to make sure that that insulation is done really thoroughly um, all the way from the outdoor unit to the indoor units. Um, in air conditioning, if we have bad line set insulation, we can get other problems. We can get condensation inside walls and other things like that that can cause a lot of uh, headaches. Um, and then the last thing, and I think one of the things that's most often neglected, is to do good customer education. Um, you know, our installers are good installers, they're not necessarily good educators. And they're often finishing up these jobs at the end of a long day and uh, don't necessarily, historically have not always left the homeowner with everything they need to know about uh, how to operate the system efficiently, what maintenance is needed and so on. So um, I think a place that, that uh, many installers, including us, could really uh, raise their game is to increase uh, customer education. I also think HeatSmart plays a real valuable role in this as well. Um, 
The education starts during the sales and design process where we you know, work with the customer to make sure we really understand what their needs are um, and also make sure that we have realistic expectations about what installing a heat pump is going to do to their fossil fuel bills, uh, how much it's going to reduce those, how much it's going to increase your electric bills correspondingly, um, what the noise level is going to be like with these systems. They are very quiet if they're installed properly, but they're not 100% silent. Um, they operate a little bit different than the fossil fuel systems people are used to. We always used to advise people with uh, gas or oil furnaces. You know, if you're if you're going away, you're going to work. Turn your furnace down. Turn it down five or ten degrees, um, and uh, set a programmable thermostat so it comes on half an hour before you come home. And with a fossil fuel system, especially an oversized one that could recover very quickly, that was a great way to save energy. Heat pumps operate a lot more efficiently if you leave the temperature alone. We we recommend we say set it and forget it. Um, that allows them to stay in the middle of their modulation range, kind of just cruising along, um, you know, kind of like a, a car at a steady highway speed rather than trying to really floor it to bring your house back up to temperature after it's been in a, a deep setback. Um, and then just making sure that people know what maintenance and service is expected. Um, you know, uh, it's not unusual to get a call or go to an energy audit uh, and uh, see someone that had a, you know, a, a heat pump installed five years ago and uh, you ask them, oh, has this been serviced? And they're like, oh, do we need to service it? Do we need to clean the filters? Yes, if you want these things to last a long time and operate efficiently. And that's not a homeowner failure, that's a, uh, that's a contractor failure. If we're not educating people about the right way to take care of this equipment, uh, we're not gonna get good results. Um, one of the things that we've done to help our uh, installers do a better job of education is create a uh, one page um, quick guide. It kind of boils down the frequently asked questions and the uh, most important uh, operating modes that you'll be using with your system. It's a lot more, a lot easier to navigate than the, um, you know, the 15 or 20 page manual that comes from the manufacturer and also uh, kind of steers homeowners away from functions that, that don't really make sense in our climate. Um, so uh, just to share here for anyone who's interested in learning more about these subjects, uh, here are some resources that have been really useful to me. Um, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, which is uh, the group that certifies cold climate heat pumps, also has some excellent guides on sizing, installing um, uh, cold climate heat pumps. Um, a lot of the recommendations here are, are right out of their, uh, their uh, uh, guidelines. Um, Green Building Advisor is a, a great discussion uh, group and uh, um, subscription site uh, for discussions on energy efficient building and, and there's a lot of discussions on there on cold climate heat pumps. Um, the Stephen Winner's uh, group study that I mentioned where they were looking at, uh, they looked at a lot of things including airflow and uh, overall efficiency of cold climate heat pumps. Um, there's a link to that here. Um, I strongly recommend anyone that's installing these go to every manufacturer's training you can. A lot of these are given locally in uh, Syracuse and, and Rochester and Elmira. Um, there's, each one is a little bit different and each time you'll go away from it with some, some new piece of information that's gonna help you do um, a better job. And then um, the article itself uh, that I wrote on this is behind a paywall, um, but I am allowed to uh, mail out reprints to anyone who's interested. So please don't hesitate to email uh, these to me and I will, I will get a, a reprint right out to you. Um, that's it. I, um, uh, I think we have some time. Yeah, we have some time for questions and I'll stick around as long as needed. Thank you so much, John. Can you unshare your screen so we can all look at each other? Yeah. That's terrific. Thank you, um, 
that I learned a lot and I can't wait to hear what people's questions are. So um, the rest of this webinar time is for all of you who joined us to ask your questions of uh, John Herod or, and um, Jonathan and I and Lindsay are also here to answer questions about the HeatSmart process. So who wants to kick that off? I get, if you wanna talk, you'll done, oh, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, um, either Lisa or, or Jonathan, um, are the nice, is the NYSERDA energy audit um, program still in existence? Okay, the question is, and sorry, your audio is pretty shaky, Wayne. The question is, is the NYSERDA home energy audit program still in existence? That was for um, um, any of us, I guess. And uh, the question, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, John, Harrod, do you wanna explain how the energy audits work? Yeah, the, um, the program's been changed a little bit uh, in the last couple months, but you still are eligible for a, a no cost energy audit and um, Lisa, I believe all the HeatSmart installers are participants in that program. Um, Daily Electric doesn't do that kind of energy audit yet. Um, they do like one, you know, an assessment for for a heat pump installation, but not the full home energy audit. All the other installers do. Um, with um, the COVID uh, situation, uh, we have been directed not to do blower door tests. Um, but we are able to do on-site assessments. We are also able to do uh, remote assessments if those are, are more comfortable um, for people. And actually that reminds me, I lost my head a second. I have a few more slides that I'm gonna show real quick. Um, so I apologies for that. I was so caught up in John's presentation um, that I forgot to show my last few slides. So bear with me. So um, Snug Planet is one of HeatSmart Tompkins four competitively selected installer partners and Snug Planet is also a partner in the HeatSmart Central New York program. Um, are you partners in any other programs, John? Uh, the uh, Central New York. Yeah, Central New York. So we have four installers that we work with um, and they are Snug Planet, that's a whole home, um, in, um, partner, they do insulation, air sealing, heat pumps, energy audits, and Halco um, Energy also does all of those things, as well as heat, uh, air source heat pump and ground source heat pump installations. Um, and then we have our two partners, Daily Electric and NP Environmental, who do heat pump installations um, exclusively. They do not do um, insulation and air sealing. So they, if you need insulation air sealing, they will refer you to Halco or Snug Planet for that. Um, if you can use more than one of our installers, we've had people use three of our installers, one for heat pump, one for insulation, and one for a water heater. So you can, um, you can mix and match as works for you. And uh, we highly recommend all these installers. They do quality work. They use the best equipment. They um, give Heat Smart and Rollies the, their most competitive price. And, um, and they are uh, time tested and approved. <laughs> um, okay, so the way to get started with HeatSmart is to go to our website, heatsmarttompkins.org and fill out a very short form under where it says enrollment. And when you do that, it will ask you which installers you would like to um, get an assessment from. You can choose one, two, three, or all four. Um, and then they will get in touch with you. If you say email, they'll email you. If you say phone call, they'll call you. Um, these home assessments are free and there's no obligation to you. So there's really just no downside if you are starting to think about um, some changes you wanna make and you wanna know what the installers um, would recommend for your particular house, um, this is the way to get started. And then Jonathan and I are here for you as a, as a resource to help you through the whole process. So now we'll go to our questions um, and I will unshare, sorry about that. <laughs> and hopefully uh, you've typed more questions in the chat while I was doing that. 
So Sarah Stewart says, would a heat pump system work well in a 150 year old brick home with high ceilings and old windows? Can it operate through an existing duct system or, all the, or, or, or are wall units needed? Great question, John. Yeah, um, so we certainly have uh, done retrofits in houses of that age. Um, the question you know, goes back to sizing. How do we get enough BTUs out of uh, the heat pumps to meet the requirements of the um, of the house that may have you know kind of minimal wall insulation um, and so on? So you know we start with an assessment. We'd figure out uh, where the opportunities are to improve insulation and air tightness, uh, which of those are cost effective, and then what would it take to uh, uh, get enough heat into this house. And it can be done. It absolutely can be done. Um, we are doing a lot of systems that use existing ductwork. Um, one of the challenges that we run into is that older ductwork in our area was sized for fossil fuel systems, which needed a lot lower air flows per BTU than heat pumps. So, you know, that's something that has to come into play. Uh, we may end up recommending duct upgrades or some kind of uh, combination of ducted and ductless heads to meet the, the full requirement. Um, Sarah, do you want to follow up or does that fully answer your question? You can unmute yourself if you want to speak. And I would say to Sarah, I have a very old home too. The older and more, um, complicated the house and the, and the more I would recommend getting a number of different proposals um, because different installers will have different ideas and it will help you really figure out what it is that you want. Um, speaking for myself, it took me a year to figure out what I wanted. So, <laughs> and a lot of proposals. So, um, and what I ended up with was not what anything that any of the installers recommended, but by then I had figured out what I really wanted and then I was able to ask for it. <laughs> so it's a process. Um, what what kind of fuel are you on now, Sarah? Uh, so we have a, a propane furnace. We love to hear that because um, people heating with propane who switch to an air source or a ground source system are going to save so much money and be so much happier. Um, so you're right now with the most expensive possible way to heat your home and we can offer you something so much more efficient that will also save money. So that is... Um, Good news. <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear and um, really good advice uh, to, yeah. to get multiple uh, evaluations. Right, um, good. I will say um, if for anybody who is, can't decide whether they should get an air source or a ground source system, our webinar one week from today, Nick Proputniewicz from NP Environmental, his topic is uh, air source or ground source, how to decide. So um, tune in for that one because that is going to be fun. Um, some people start out wanting one and ending up deciding to go with the other way for, um, and sometimes only one will really work for your house. So um, working with our installers helps you figure that, that out and we'll, uh, you'll be excited to see that. And then uh, this Thursday at lunchtime, Halco Energy will be presenting um, a, a, a retrofit from a, um, I believe it's an oil boiler to um, to a ground source heat pump system, so you won't want to miss that either. Okay, more questions. Let's see. Um, Dan says, um, "Is Mitsubishi the only manufacturer in the hyperheat type of tech getting more heat out of the air source heat pump systems in our cold winter climates?" No, they are not. John, you want to address Dan's question? Sure, sure. Um Mitsubishi is, uh, you know, one of the dominant manufacturers. If you go to that uh, NEEP website, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, you'll see a complete list of all cold climate heat pumps. Uh, Snug Planet installs Mitsubishi and LG. Um, Fujitsu is another major manufacturer, but there's several now, and, and I think the, the marketplace is, is um, expanding. Yeah, I'll add on to that, that in our program, um, we have installers that install Fujitsu, LG, and Mitsubishi. And um, we really 
only allow um, in our program what we consider to be the top of the line, most efficient um, kinds of heat pumps that will really operate satisfactorily in some of the cold temperatures that we get here in New York State. So um, not every heat pump will do that, but all the ones that are installed by in our program will. Um, more questions. Um, Natalie says, which brand slash model units have soft start and stop as well as nighttime low sounds mode? I'll let John answer that too. I will say, Natalie, I personally am very sensitive to noise. I just hate noise of equipment noise. And the heat pump units, even sitting right under them, do not bother me at all. Um, they can, but I'll let John um, answer the, no the noise question. Yeah, noise is, is something to think about with these systems. Uh, typically, we want to have a certain number of, of linear feet of line set between the indoor and the outdoor unit uh, for noise sensitive situations. And uh, for most uh, Mitsubishi, what I'm most familiar with, that's, that's 16 linear feet. So if you had one of these heads in a bedroom, I would recommend offsetting the outdoor unit some distance so that you could get at least 16 linear feet. Um, they do come with decibel ratings and uh, I will say that in my experience the what we call the one-to-ones, the ones that have one indoor unit to one outdoor unit tend to be uh, a little bit quieter than the multi-head units. John, Natalie also wanted to know, sorry I missed her question further up, so she says, would an exterior unit sited directly outside a bedroom wall produce too much noise for sleeping in a very quiet rural area? In my experience, no. I think the best thing, if, if that's a concern, is to actually look at the decibel ratings. And um, I have a, a free app on my phone that measures decibels in the ambient environment. And so if you see something that's rated at 20 decibels, I'll walk around and find something that is, you know, 20 decibels and, and see how that uh, strikes you. I think it's a great question to ask and I would by all means rather have these kind of questions asked and discussed prior to installing the unit <laughs> as opposed to someone calling me and saying, you know, this, this is waking me up at night. Um, good design uh, can, can eliminate almost all the noise related issues. Um, I believe Natalie also asked a question about the soft start and stop. I know that the, um, the Mitsubishi one-to-one uh, -one units uh, have, have a very quiet mode that's like that. I just wanted uh, to add uh, uh, go ahead. a note of personal experience there because we have uh, a fairly large uh, single zone unit just outside our bedroom. and most of the time we don't hear it at all. Uh, I think that the line set is a little shorter uh, than what John was recommending and I would reinforce his recommendation because what we do sometimes get in very cold weather when it's working hard is kind of a moaning that we can but I, that's not a normal thing and I've been told well to having too short of a line set. Does that sound right John? Yeah, I think so. That's the main thing you would hear, some kind of refrigerant noise or sometimes actually a, a little teeny bit of compressor noise, but it's having that having that distance tends to eliminate all of that. And we've got we've actually got four single zone units and there's another place where there are three of them all clustered together and you still don't hear them inside the house. You 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 can certainly can hear them if you're out in the yard close to them, but um, they're, they're not very loud anymore. They're nothing like the old air conditioner units that looked like that. So I'll jump in and Natalie, um, this is where COVID is getting in our way because part of our program is we have home tours where you can actually visit people who've had these installed and sit right next to the unit and the inside and the outside and hear it for yourself or not hear it. <laughs> um, we do have some video home tours and we have um, one we I don't think we've posted it yet, but we're going to post it soon where she sort of uh, demonstrates the noise level. That said, a video, of course, is not as good as meeting the heat, the heat pump face to face. Um, and 
uh, I remember this couple. Do you remember Jonathan, an older couple who um, came to one of our presentations, were pretty skeptical, but they wanted to pursue it and they visited uh, um, one of our, they came to one of our home tours and they sat there under the heat pump and the, the gentleman kept saying, well, I think you've convinced my wife. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you're in a hurry for the project that try, try looking at those videos, if you are um, thinking ahead to something you want for the fall or next year, it may be possible for you to visit um, and experience um, one of these heat pump systems in person. So let us know um, what you have in mind. And, and, um, and that's, you know, I think it's really, really important that people get to meet, get to meet their, uh, someone they're going to live with for uh, many years. <laughs> you want to interview that, that uh, equipment quite closely. Other questions? I will say, um, I did say this webinar went to 12.45, it's 12.55. So if you are staying on to be polite and you've had everything answered, you're welcome to go. We thank you for coming. Please look for, um, check out our website. There's also the HeatSmart CNY website, HeatSmart Southern Tier website. If you're in those regions, um, get in touch, enroll. Um, let us know what, what your needs are and your questions are. Um, if you want to stay on though, Jonathan and um, John and Lindsay and I, I think we'll stay on as long as uh, anybody has any more questions for us. So thanks for joining us today. Also look for a short survey that may come in the uh, an email from me um, to let us know how this webinar met your needs and what we could do to improve. Um, so Natalie says, yes, of course, the quality of silence very late at night would affect the degree of noise perceived in your bedroom. Um, that's right, exactly. And um, if you're like me, you're used to sleeping with the windows open because you don't have air conditioning yet. Um, if you were running air conditioning, your window would be closed. <laughs> so that changes things a lot. Yeah, Jonathan lives in an extremely quiet rural area on top of a very high hill next to the state forest. It doesn't get quieter than that. Um, and I, I wanted to make a couple comments to the um, backing, you know, reinforcing Lisa's statement about the home tours. It's a common conversation that we've seen at multiple tours where people say, is it on? And they can't really tell if it's even running. Yes, the answer is yes, it's on, it's running. Um, so that, they really don't bother people. One noise that I have had people uh, uh, complain about that it seems to bother a few people much more than others is the uh, re the defrost cycle. When it goes into defrost cycle in winter, there's a brief couple of minutes. The noise isn't so much, it's not so much that it's louder, but it changes. And um, uh, the, I don't know, I, I had a party uh, when ours were new and we wanted people to hear that. Uh, but we were all sit, standing around chatting and talking. We stood there for 25, for 45 minutes. I'm sure it went through two defrost cycles and we never noticed. Even though we wanted, we were, look, we were trying to listen to them, but I just get distracted. But I have had people say that it bothers them. So that's something that is worth listening to. For most people, it's not an issue at all. Any other questions? I, I know I had a ton of questions, but I, I'm holding back because I learned so much from John's um, slideshow. And I also have to say, I thought it was hilarious that you showed a picture of what looked like a dead sea creature on top of your, um, your ducting. <laughs> I think that was the uh, insulation. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> but that was yeah, I have a I have a question. This oh, is Jerry, Jerry. and I, I did write it into the chat, but I'll I'll speak it. It's easier. Uh, this video, I imagine, is going to be wildly popular because it was just so well done. Uh, I so appreciate it, uh, John and Lisa, both of you. And uh, so I'm wondering, what is the geographical area in which uh, you would agree to? He, um, Snug would agree to work for those who don't live in the CNY Heat Smart Territory or Tompkins Heat Smart Territory. Yeah, so we will we will gladly go to any 
county that touches Tompkins County. Um, okay. So that, that includes, you know, a good bit of the, the southern tier. And um, we'll go further on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but we're, we're a small company, and so we, we try not to get spread too thin. Yes, I really appreciate that answer. Thank you, John. Sure. And the, and the Heat Smart programs, if you're outside of, if you're interested in, you're outside of SNUG's territory, um, we can help connect you with contractors who follow the best practices um, that John has outlined. So, um, or hopefully they have the same ones, or maybe they have their own, but um, we have, we don't know because they haven't given this webinar. <laughs> But we have very high levels of customer satisfaction and also um, all of our installer partners are NYSERDA approved installers and that means that they've had to subject themselves to NYSERDA um, spot inspections throughout their time and um, that means that they have quality assurance inspections looking at their work um, and, and that um, information is publicly available. So. Um, so we have high confidence in, in all of their installations, but also from our personal knowledge of them. But there's also a third party <laughs> checking up. Any further questions? Otherwise, I'll just thank everybody for coming and um, go back to packing up my mother-in-law's apartment. <laughs> I'm joining you from Pittsburgh today, by the way. So go Pirates. <laughs> Natalie has a question about so Natalie, um, we might do. Do you know offhand, um, John? It, it it will depend what size and what configuration of the heat pump, not just the model number. I think Natalie wants to know which manufacturer's heat pump is the quietest. Yeah, I'm just gonna put my email address right here in the chat, and um, if uh, if Natalie, you want to reach out to me, I'll. I'll give you a, um, you know, a, a more thorough answer when I have the, uh, the spec sheets in front of me. It, it will depend on more than one factor. It isn't That's just fine. buying a model number. And as John said, the installation can really impact that too. So, um, all right, great. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Feel free to follow up with, um, with any of your, with your local HeatSmart program, further questions, you can call, you can email us, you can go to our website. Um, please join us for further webinars. See the recent webinar videos on our website and have a great day. Hope to see you on Thursday and next Tuesday. Thanks a lot. Awesome. I'll just leave that up so people can see. Um, Lindsay has put her contact information in the chat. I'll follow up with that in an email too. And Lindsay, I shared the spread, the sign up spreadsheet with you. I don't know if you saw. Clearly, I haven't yet, so I will go take a look. A little bit before this. Great. Thanks so much, John. That was very um, informative. Super great. Thank you. Stop recording. All right, I'm gonna.